Hello, hello, Shagath the Known here. Welcome to another Rust coding stream with a roguelike tutorial in Rust here on the 5th of October 2022, local time 1734. So I'm feeling much better than last time. Also, if you watch my gameplay streams, ignore the fact that I'm wearing the same shirt. I have this weird schedule from uh, like Tuesday and Wednesday. That's the like that's the weird day where basically um, like I shower late Tuesday, like right before the stream. But then because I work in the office on uh, Wednesday, I like I, I get home and I eat and then I'm like here. So I don't like I mean, I could go later. I could just start later, but I just wait until after this stream to shower again. So it's like this weird schedule, um, but it is what it is. It's like I'm not that filthy of a person. It's just like this is the weird day and then like it normalizes after Wednesday because uh, I work in the office on Wednesdays and Thursdays and uh, switching the schedules around between the two days that's where it gets weird um, so anyway enough of that um, I'm feeling much better than last time I had a what ended up being one of my one of the worst headaches of my life on Monday on the last coding stream it you know I thought it was going away after I started the stream and then it got worse than it started and it didn't go away until the next day sometime. Um, it was still pretty bad even at like three o'clock in the morning. So not a good time, um, but I'm feeling much better and I'm ready to go ahead and tackle a couple of, a couple of these, uh, a couple of these, <laughs> a couple of these uh, sections here. We'll do the field of view and we'll do the monsters and maybe deal in damage but probably just leave it at two. It'll depend on how long we spend. Um, so that's enough of that. That's enough of me rambling on about different things. Let's go ahead and get started with the field of view. I was really hoping to do this last time, but you know, things happen. So um, we have a nicely drawn, actually let's, let's take one quick look at what we have because we're describing the map and everything that we have. So let's take a look at it. Boom, there it is. Scoot that around on my screen. So we have a map we can navigate around. Um, we still don't have... Oh, we do. Oh, we don't have diagonal controls yet, but we do have numpad controls, so that's good. Um, yeah, that's all there is to it. Simple, right? Let's get back over here. So we have a nicely drawn map, but it shows the whole dungeon. That reduces the usefulness of exploration. If we already know where everything is, why bother exploring? In this chapter will add field of view and adjust rendering to show the parts of the map we've already discovered. It will also refactor the map into its own structure rather than just a vector of tiles. So this chapter starts with the code from chapter four. So this is interesting. Um, I already like where this is going. Refactoring the map. I didn't realize we were going to do that, but it actually it makes sense because there's a lot of information that's important in relation to a map. So it's, you know, instead of tracking it separately or having to derive it or something, um, we, we have this struct here that's actually gonna manage that for us. So that's cool. Um, and I guess width and height, that's gonna be, yeah, okay. So we'll keep map related functions and data together to keep things as clear as we make an ever more complicated game. The bulk of this is creating a new map structure and moving our helper functions to its implementation. Now, I don't believe we've really talked about impl blocks that much for... No, we... Well... Yeah, we did impl state here. So we have. Okay. I'm mixing up things, so bear with me. Um, I was going to make sure if we'd talked about them in context of, like, just an impl on a, a struct versus implementing a trait. But no, we have done that. So I'm not going to spend any time going into that. So, so here in the, the map... Um, module map.rs we're going to have a couple of things here so we have the pub enum tile type still wall and floor um, we're going to make pub struct map and it's going to be pub tiles and that's going to be our vec right so let's have a vec of tile types and then um, pub rooms Back of rects. 
Pub width is going to be I32, and pub height is going to also be I32. And now we do an impl map. And we need X index, apply room to map, new map, rooms and corridors, apply tunnels. Maybe draw map. Probably it's related. Um, I'm not seeing it. So we're going to keep it out of the... Well, I don't know. Depends on how you want to think about it, I guess. So let's do an impl map there. And we're going to have to make some changes. So I'm going to just read over this as I go and figure out how these changes work. So... Um, X, Y index is now going to take a reference to self and it's going to be Y is U size times self dot width as U size plus X as U size. Um, that's typo there, okay. And here, new, okay, apply room to map. That's the next one on there, so let, let me just go one at a time. So we're going to take a reference to self. It's mutable. And we're still going to take the room, but we don't need the map because the map obviously comes baked in with, uh, with self, right? I mean, is it, a, it is a map. So here, instead of map, it's going to be self.tiles. And then we're going to do IDX just above this. We're going to do let IDX equal self dot XY IDX with this X and Y here. Okay. Everything else should be identical. So next we're going to look at horizontal tunnel. So instead of this tile type, this mutable map thing here, it's going to be and mute self and we're going to do let index equal self dot x y index x and y that's the same and then it's going to be self dot tiles i think everything else is identical this is probably going to be about the same because it's just the vertical tunnel so instead of this it's going to be self dot and here it's going to be self.tiles. So we're good on both of the tunnels. Next, we're going to look at new map rooms and corridors. That's the beefy one. So let's look at the function signature first. Um, it's going to return a map instead of this. So map. And then we're going to say let mute map, and instead of this vector here, it's going to be map. And we're going to let the IDE fill in the struct fields, because I like being lazy. Tiles is going to be a vec. Tile type, wall, 80 by 50. Rooms is going to be vec new because there are no rooms yet. Width is 80, height is 50. I would probably, if I were writing this, I would probably go ahead and, and write um, the function signature to actually take in a width and a height so we're not hard coding these values in. Um, that's, that's a lot of typing the same values right there and you know, we're probably not going to be typing them down here anymore. But um, the point is, if later on we decide that we want to change the size of the map or something, we have to then go and modify this function, which is not going to be the end of the world. But I would probably already go ahead and just do that since it's simple enough. But, but we'll follow along with the tutorial and see, you know, when they decide to refactor and, and the justification. So I think everything else remains the same except for where we're complaining a bit. So this 80 here, well, it's not complaining, but map dot, I'm complaining, <laughs> map dot width and map dot height. And 
looking for any map.rooms.iter. Where's that at? We have four I in zero to max rooms. I'm not sure if we're using I. So I'm gonna just change that for the moment in case that, that is a change to the uh, code. And then we make a new room. And they're still doing the let mute okay thing. I'm gonna stick with my more functional style. And again, all we're saying here is that all rooms cannot intersect, right? So all basically says we're going to iterate through and we're gonna run this closure on everything. And everything has to return true to satisfy it. So we're negating the intersect. So we're basically saying nothing can intersect. Um, apply room to map is mad because it's map dot apply room to map. And then instead of passing in an and mute map, we just pass in the new room. And yeah, so we have if rooms. So there is a bit of a difference here, though. Um, and I'm trying to catch it for other room in map.rooms.iter. So it's map.rooms.iter. That's what it is. Other room and new room. Okay, there we are. So it's, you know, another way to do all this. This is very verbose and feels a little, a little bit too C-like, so I made the call to just do it my own way. Um, and that's why I'm having to, like, translate the two, which that is unfortunate. I brought that upon myself. So if map.rooms is not empty, then we do this code here, and... Anywhere we do rooms, it's map.rooms. Map.rooms.len. And in the horizontal tunnel and the vertical tunnel stuff, actually, I don't know if we have to change anything else there. Uh, apparently we do. Oh, because it's uh, map. Yeah, yeah. I was like, that's why. We're calling it on the map. And then instead of rooms, it's map.rooms. And this raises the question, are we still making a rooms vector? We are. That's why it wasn't complaining ever. So now this will help me find any that I may have missed. Yeah, so instead of returning this, we return the map. And that makes that function happy. We should be able to work with that. Um, and that's everything. So this down here is mad. Um, new map test. I think it was maybe removed. Yeah, I think this was maybe removed from the uh, from the file now but I'm not entirely sure if they removed it or not. We can go ahead and modify just to make sure. So um, map dot, um, oh, not map. Uh, well, do I want to make this? So we'll have to do let mute map equal map. Let's do it. Quick little exercise. So then, in tiles, it's going to be vec. Um, oh, whoops, we're going to use the macro, and then it's going to be tile type. Um, what do we What do we start with? Floor. We make everything a floor, and then no wait, do we start with floor or wall? No, we start with wall. I was like, yeah, it sounds backwards. Whoops. So we make everything a wall, and then we do eighty by. 50 rooms, we do a new vec. And we do 80 and 50. Okay, and we no longer need that map there. So here we have... map.rooms.len 
map.tiles. And then map.xy index. We'll do the same thing here. Okay, those are happy. Now this one, tiles. I could have done these all at once. You could have multiple cursors at the same time. I just didn't notice that's what I wanted to do right away. Map.xy index. And then finally, um, map.tiles with that index. And then it's returning a vec. We want to change that to return a map. La mapa. Okay. And we've made that happy. I'll actually switch them out once we get over to main and, and fix main. Um, changes in main and player as well. Um, the tutorial is telling me that, but it hasn't actually shown me how to... Uh, it hasn't actually shown me the changes, so what it wants me to do is, is basically um, either figure it out or go look at the code example. So let me take a moment to see what's going on. Why? So we know x, y, index, and root, but it is coming from map. So instead of that, if we say map here, and then we say map x, y index. Takes three arguments, but two were supplied. What does it take? Is it, oh, it takes self. Not passing. Oh, we are passing around the map. Yeah, so that's fine. Um, we'll fetch the map, I presume. See, this is where I, I may be going a little bit too far off of how they're doing it. But we'll fetch the map, and then we'll say um, map.xy index. And if map.tiles destination index, blah, blah, blah. Let me double check one thing real quick. Okay, yeah, we're good. So that's made that happy. And what's the change in main is the way we're creating map now is now just going to be map. New map rooms and corridors, right. And map.rooms, zero. Okay, so we'll do map.tiles. But then this is going to break other code. So I might need to... Mm, yeah, this one's... Can I borrow it as immutable? I didn't realize this one was mad. I see why, though. We're modifying map at the same time as we're referencing it. So if we do a build on that. Yeah. So we're doing map.tiles to mutate it. And then we're also doing that index there. So what we need to do is get the two indices we're going to want to use first um, so we, it'd be like let idx1 equal this it's not great but we're this is not like real code we're gonna go with so I'm just gonna get something to work real quick let idx2 equal whatever this other one is oops that was supposed to be 2 not 22 All right, see, that makes it happy. And now we just got to slightly modify that down here. So we'll say 0, y, 
and 79y. And then we'll make this bit right here happy. Um, ID x1 and ID x2. So that's really just a bit of a consequence of the way we're, we're you know, these functions are written. But I think what's going to end up happening is we're going to crash because we're doing a fetch. Oh, no, we're not crashing. Okay. Oh, no. Yeah, we are. Okay, because we're doing a fetch. So it's down here. Well, no, that's not where I want to be. <laughs> not in that. Um... Tried to fetch map from the world, but it does not exist. Yeah, so what we're actually putting into the world, right here we're doing fetch map. What I need to do is go back to vec tile type. But then I run into the problem here where I can't do the index stuff. Whoops. I run into the problem here where I can't do the index stuff. So then we have to look basically everywhere that I'm doing fetch to get the map. I need to make sure that we're actually getting the map now instead of the uh, just the tiles. So I think what we're going to do is instead of inserting tiles, we're going to insert map. Um, we're also going to do this first before we move this. We're going to get this value here. Okay. We'll see if this is how they do it. Um, so we insert the map. And then I think we are going to crash, but I need to figure out where it's happening. Yeah, so can you tell me where I am trying to do that? Tried to fetch vec tile type from the... Yeah, but where are you, where are you doing that? Um, fetch is not in there. Not in there. Fetch is in here. Okay. So instead of vec tile type, it's going to be map. And then draw map is map draw. Oh no, wait, wait. Mismatch types. Expected slice. So it's going to be map tiles. Now did I make it happy? Yeah. Sweet. So that was my take on this refactor. They didn't show all the code, so that was, you know, maybe not the way they did some of this. And I want to compare and contrast now, but I was just showing how I would go about doing this. But I want to also do something else before we continue. In main, where we make the map, I want to swap this out, and instead of that, I want to say map new map test and we're just going to overwrite that other map i'm going to delete the line in a minute so we'll make we'll make a map then we'll throw it away and make another map so we did fail um index out of bounds the length is zero screwed up an in index somewhere oh we don't make rooms on yeah we don't make rooms on that map so that's not going to work so we'll have to do something like, uh, what is it, um, 25, 25 is good enough, it's in the map, that's all I care about. This is a quick hard code, yeah! So it's not really the proper map though, is it? Almost want to break down and see what's, uh, what's wrong with it, but... You know we're not going to be using this code. Solid boundaries and ran 400 randomly placed walls. I probably broke something with one of the indices or something. Down here, maybe. If index is... So we randomly check. And then we say if the index is not equal to the center... And we set it to a wall. Oh, you know what I did? 
This one, I think, does start out as a floor. That's... I was correct initially. Yeah. Okay, cool. See, we can we can play this. So we, we made both of them work, where we can swap the functions in and out. It's a little bit messy how we do it. And because rooms are not defined for this one, we can't use our actual room-related code. But it's cool to see how you could swap them in and out a little bit like that. So what I want to do now, and I know you don't really see what I'm doing at the moment, but I'm going to just pull up the source code and verify a couple of things compared to what I just did. Um, so we'll look at main, and I'll look at map, and I'll look at player. Player sounds easy, so we're going to go to player. And we have map, player, position, state, tile type. We have something else that we haven't done yet, so that's okay. Um, and we are fetching the map, so I was correct on that. Um, that we are passing the whole map, which makes sense. Um, that's why I made that assumption. If map.tiles, and then we have a destination index is not equal to a wall, we do all that stuff, okay. Um, the destination index is map.xy index. Yeah, it's the same thing, okay. So I did that correctly, at least compared to how they did it. Um, next, I'm going to look at map.rs. Uh, was there anything else I wanted to look at? Okay, there's some more impuls in here, but we're not going to get into those yet. Um, I guess we're adding those this time. And next up, there is in main.rs. All I really want to look for is the code that makes the map and just see if they did anything slightly different. So let map equal map new map rooms and corridors. And in the uh, room zero dot center and then insert the map. Yeah, that's really it. Cool. So good enough, right? A uh, little bit time consuming there, but uh, I handled that just fine on my own. I didn't need a tutorial to tell me how to refactor a few basic things like that. Um, we ended up with the same result. So I, I decided to do it that way just to show how you'd go about doing a refactor like that instead of having someone tell you, well, this is how we do it. Um, there's a little bit of assumptions and, and you know, logic that, logic-based assumptions that go into that, which is why I decided, oh, we're probably going to be putting the entire map into the ECS now. So then that dictated how I used things down the line and, and changed what I was fetching and all that. And that's why even before I ran it, I was able to say it's going to crash because we're fetching the wrong thing. That's why I was able to, de to deduce that and, and kind of figure that out. Um, but it makes sense. If you're creating a map struct, you probably want to work with the entire struct, right? So anyway, um, that's that. Let's get back over here to the tutorial. Uh, there's changes in main and player too. We can see the example source for all the details. It's cleaned up the code quite a bit. We can pass a map around instead of a vector. If we want to teach map to do more things, we have a place to do so. So the field of view component. Not just the player has limited visibility. Eventually, we'll want monsters to consider what they can see too. So since it's reusable code, we'll make a view shed component. I like the word view shed. It comes from the cartography world. Literally, what can I see from here? What is this? Oh, I thought it was actually a link. I was like, what is it linked to? Um, literally, what can I see from here? And it perfectly describes our problem. We'll give each entity that has a view shed a list of tile indices they can see. So in component RS, We'll do a little bit of work here. Oh, hold on. I hear something at my door.
Okay, sorry about that. Let me make sure OBS is good. Okay. Yeah, I had a package delivered. Wanted to make sure I grabbed that. Okay, so we're looking at the code, and what I was gonna be doing is adding a new component. So we'll derive component. And what is it? Pubstruct um, view shed. Pub visible tiles. And it's a vec of RLTK point. Now I guess point is like going to be used like coordinates. It's interesting that it comes with RLTK. Let's take a look at point real quick. I like to know what I'm using. So yeah, helper struct defining a 2D point in space. In other words, struct point x i32 y i32 boom. Basically something along those lines, but it probably has a lot of things attached to it. So let's take a closer look at it if I can. Mm, it's linking me to the impulse. Okay, it's literally yeah, what I said, except they made them public. And then it has 24 implementations. So it's implementing from I32, I32. So um, this is a tuple here. Um, you can do it from F32 tuples. Uh, you could do it from a VEC2. There's all kinds of things. Support dividing a point by a point impl. Uh, like there's all kinds of things that it can do. Add, assign, sub assign, all that fun stuff. So it's got a lot of cool stuff that we don't have to implement. They brought it in here, but it's a pretty basic, simple. Um, oh, it's right. We're in the file here. Yeah, so like impl point, we can do a, we can make a new one. It's generic, so it takes different types. We gotta be able to do a try into I32. That's the constraint on it. Um, create a new point from I32. This can be constant. Okay. Create a zero point. And like I said, there's from tuple. So yeah, there's all kinds of stuff. I don't need to go into any more on that. So we've made the component and then in, um, we'll register the component in main. So remember we have to do that with all components. So it's gonna be view shed. And we'll give the player a view shed component. So when we're creating the player right here, we'll do dot with view shed. And what's it going to be? Visible tiles is a new vec. Don't ask why I always type new 30 or in 32. It's just a weird thing. Like it's a weird typo I make. Sometimes when I'm typing new, I do in 32. And sometimes when I'm typing I 32, I do I E W. So I get this like weird, those buttons just mix up when I'm typing. Uh, range is eight. That's our view. I like that because we're defining um, what our view can be or what our range can be in an easy way that we can then change it later. Um, we could even change it as like as we play the game. What if we put on some glasses that gives us better viewing or something, right? Or what if we get like a debuff that makes us blinded or something that reduces our vision to like a range of four? Right, so there, this would be something you could modify, which is pretty smart, I like it. So let's take a look back over here at Le Tutorial. So uh, lastly, main.rs, yeah, so we, we, make, we, we make the component, we register it with the ECS, and then we'll give the player that view shed component, which you just saw me do, visible tiles is a new vec, and range is eight. Player's getting quite complicated now. That's good. It shows what an ECS is good for. A new system. Hey, thank you for that follow, Grenache. Appreciate it. A new system. Generic view sheds. So we'll start by defining a system to take care of this for us. We want to be generic. So it works for anything that can benefit from knowing what it can see. We create a new file. So we, have, we want visibility system dot rs and i'll go ahead and start running this down and we can we can kind of figure out what's going on as i go through it here so let's make a um new file what was it again visibility 
system.rs and it's going to be use specs uses the prelude uh, yeah the prelude and we're going to use specs derive it looks like or no no my bad we're gonna use super view shed and that's my double colon there we're gonna use view shed and position and now we're making a a struct here but this is like a tag struct um, Basically, it's not going to have any info in it, but it's uh, essentially a tag struct that we can do an impl block on. So we, I think we did this before with the system, uh, and that's what we're doing right here. We're implementing system for this struct. It's an interesting way to name your systems. Basically, just slap it, you know, onto a struct. All right, so we're going to impl system for visibility system we have to specify these lifetimes here so type system data equals we have write storage and it's going to be a view shed and that makes sense because we already saw view shed has a vec of tiles in it so we should expect that those are going to be modified because we have to populate them somehow. All right. Why is it mad? I must have missed something. Write storage. Oh, we need a comma after the lifetime. Okay. And now we need the actual function. see look at this real quick I have a little bit of exposure to Scala myself but it's it's been quite a few years but it's uh I quite liked it what what little Scala that I used I quite liked it um I think rust is fun like I I think rust is a lot like there's a couple of great explanations I, I i kind of said it feels like writing c plus plus and, and c with more of a python like syntax it's a much more high level than than in terms of the kind of code that you write um but uh another one i liked was the description of functional c that's a really cool description also your english is perfectly fine no, no problems there but well, hope you're doing well again thank you for the follow what kind of uh what kind of big data stuff do you do? Like, uh, is it just like a lot of processing, like large amounts of data? Like, I, I don't really know too much what goes into that. Um, I've been more explicitly a uh, software engineer. So I, you know, write code basically. I don't really know like how, what other fields in the industry do. So here we have um, view shed and position. Okay. So we've got our run function for this system. And this is something I want to actually talk about for a minute that I I never talked about this after we we dealt with the ECS on stream before, but this is um, this is important the way this join works because I was actually really curious about it and I was asking a lot of questions and I was concerned about performance. So let, let's just take a look at 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 the idea of how this join works in specs. This is different for every ECS. Um, every entity component system might do things different. Well, they they probably will do things differently. Um, Specs uses something, there's a crate in Rust called high bit set. And it does have a limit of, it, it depends on your system, it depends on the use size of your system. But the limit, like the maximum limit on any, on any system I think is only a couple million. Um, so if you wanna have like, you know, 10 million entities, you can't do that. Um, because everything in specs is driven by this high bit set. 
And the way you basically think about it is for each component that you have, you have one of those high bit set structs and your entity ID in the bit set maps to whether that component is active or not for that ID. So if we can imagine, I'll draw a little thing here in the comments. And we'll say we have a component. I'll get to that comment in just a moment when I'm done with this, but I, I see you. Uh, we have a view shed component. And then we have, um, we'll say five entities. So we have five entities and we have a view shed component. Then we have zero, 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 zero. And then down here we have another component, um, player, zero, 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 zero. Um, what's another one that we had? Um, what are my components again? Renderable and position. So position and renderable. So this represents, um, again, the actual high bit set is going to be like a million or whatever. I'm not going to draw out a million here. So we could just pretend it has a max of five entities um, for the little demonstration of how it works. But basically, um, when, when you make, when you insert your first entity, let's say it's the player, um, we give it some components. We give it a player component, a position component, a renderable component, and a view shed component. So now we have our first thing in the ECS. And let's say I insert another thing and it has a position and a renderable, but nothing else. And let's say I insert another thing that has no position, or that has a position, but it is not renderable for whatever reason. And we'll say I insert one more that has a position and is renderable and has a view shed, maybe it's like a monster or something. And then we'll just pretend there's nothing in the last. So what happens is, um, high bit set. What happens with the uh, high bit set thing in specs is that like all of your components and everything map to this high bit set. This is my understanding from, from the little like research that I did after that other stream. Um, so if there's anything I'm slightly off on, forgive me, I'm, I'm you know, I'm learning how the, specs ECS works as I go. So um, the idea is that this first slot here would be like entity ID zero. This next one's entity ID one, two, three, and four. So then if you query to say, give me like right here, we're saying, give me everything that has view shed and position. So if we did that down here, um, view shed plus position, then we would be looking at these two high bit sets and basically doing a join, basically like doing a union of both of those. So you're actually doing like a, a bitwise and, um, and then whatever is, whatever comes out as a one, which would be one, zero, zero, one, zero, because those are the, the entity uh, ID zero and entity ID three, are the only two that actually have both view shed and position. So that's how Specs is able to do the join very quickly by doing that and essentially between all of the bit sets to figure out, okay, here's all the things that have both a view shed and a position. And we can make that more complex. We could then add in plus player. And then of course, the only one that's gonna show up for that is, is the first one here. So when we do that join, that's essentially what's happening under the hood. And that's, and the reason I wanted to go into this and mention is because the other day I was kind of questioning, how do these things get smushed together? What if there's like a million components or like, uh, excuse me, like a million entities and you're doing this query and there's only like two things that match. How can you do that efficiently? Um, that's how specs does it. So that's enough of that aside, but I thought it would be worth going into because it's a question I raised, and I would think other people might be asking the same if they don't know how Specs uh, does things. Let me take a quick look over at this comment now. Oh, that actually sounds awesome. Consume sensor data from offshores.
No, that that is cool. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, of AI and machine learning. When I first started studying computer science, um, I actually began with AI. That was my initial focus. So definitely a big fan of that. And and that actually makes sense that to train AI and machine learning algorithms and stuff, you need a lot of data. So yeah, it makes sense that you know what you're doing would be used for that. That's cool. Um, okay, so anyway, back back on this now, we have our, our um, basic struct in here, our visibility system, and we've defined system data as needing view shed and position, and then we're doing a join on those. So we're getting every entity that has both a view shed and position, and in these variables here, view, view shed and, and pause are going to represent the view shed and position for a single entity. And we need to actually, we're going to define that in a minute, it looks like. So the first thing we want to do is actually add this to our run systems function in, um, in our systems, uh, run systems here for impulse state. So back over here, we have let mute viz equal visibility system. And we have viz.run now and self.ecs. And we can't find this because we're not bringing it in yet. So we'll do mod visibility system and pub you or no, just use. We don't need to export it. Visibility system, visibility system. Okay. Now it's getting mad why. Oh, whoops. That should make it happy. Had an accidental uh, capital there. So there we are. We have an empty system. It's doing nothing yet, but it is in place. So let's just click back over for just uh, sync back up with this. We've already kind of explained everything that's in place here. We've just brought that system into our run systems function for our game state. We import everything for the module, and uh, yeah, this doesn't actually do anything yet, but we've added a system into the dispatcher. As soon as we flesh out the code to actually plot the visibility, it will apply to every entity that has both a view shed and a position component. So what we're gonna do now is ask RLTK for a view shed. It's a, uh, and it says trait implementation. Okay, so yeah, I can see here we're impl algorithm 2D, so there's gonna be something going on here. Um, RLTK is written to not care about how you've chosen to lay out your map. I want it to be useful for anyone, and not everyone does maps the way this tutorial does. To act as a bridge between our map implementation and RLTK provides some traits for us to support. For this example, we need base map and algorithm 2D. Don't worry, they're simple enough to implement. So we're going to go to map.rs and implement algorithm 2D. Let's see how that goes. Um, Guess I'll just put it like right down here before we draw a map. We'll do impl algorithm 2D for map. How's it going, Omnivore? Hope you're doing all right. All right. And we're going to be using points some more, so I'm going to get rid of that there and actually import it. And, okay, no, so we also have to impl base map to satisfy algorithm 2D. So can I, oh no, that's not what I want. Okay, we'll, we'll have to, we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, point new self.width, self.height. What, what are you laughing at? <laughs> so now we also need to impl base map. Well, the problem is it, it wanted me to satisfy the base map trait, but we're just going to do it with impl base map instead of uh, having it automatically just throw everything in there. Because <laughs> all we need to do to satisfy this is um, is opaque. And it returns a bool. That's all good. Self.tiles index as you size. Okay, so we're defining 
Oh, it's underscored there. Okay. We're defining, um, I think we're describing what tiles are opaque. So there's a test that you can do to decide if something is opaque, and we're describing that test here by saying self.tiles equal tile type wall. And, and the idea is, if that's the case, then this tile is opaque, and that's all it needs to know for now. And what we're doing up here is just setting the dimensions of the map, and it uses the point to do it, which is kind of odd, but it, it I understand why, I guess, but it's a little bit of an odd way to do it, I guess. Okay, um, you're basically just defining the corner of the map, and you can deduce all the dimensions from that. So, yeah, it works. Let's uh, click back over. Um, so, we yeah, we've got the two imples in. I'll go ahead and read this middle section. RLTK is able to figure out a lot of other traits from the dimensions function, point indexing, and it's reciprocal, bounds checks, and similar. We use return the dimensions where we return the dimensions we're already using, self.width and self.height. We also need to support base map. We don't need all of it yet, so we're gonna let it use defaults. And map.rs will do the impl base map, which is what I just did. And is opaque simply returns true if the tile is a wall and false otherwise. This will have to be expanded if and when we add more types of tiles, but it works for now. So we'll leave the rest of the trait are, uh, on defaults for now, so no need to enter anything else. So now we're gonna ask RLTK for a view shed. So we're gonna go back to the visibility system and we have what we need to request a view shed from RLTK. So we'll extend the file to look like this. Well, let's do it. Uh, visibility system, we have this empty run here and I don't know how much else we need from here. Um, which approach exactly? I really like I really like this this entire approach that they're doing here, the way they've separated everything out. Is there anything that's standing out to you in particular? Um, the, the way the ECS is being used in, in tandem with the, the nice organization of like splitting apart the map and the player and the, the rectangles and the components and everything, like it, it is a very nice structure. So we're gonna, okay, so we're gonna get the, okay, no, before we actually do the loop, we're gonna get the map, right? Let map mute view shed position equal data. So we're actually modifying this a bit more. So um, system data is being expanded and we're gonna say data right here. And then we're going to say read storage. Read storage, and it's going to be a lifetime of A and a map. Can't find map. Uh, bring it in right here. Component is not implemented for map. Um, I thought it was. We've been using it. Now that's odd. Let's take a look at the map. Did I just miss doing that earlier? Let me double check. Well, we've been using it. We, we, add, oh, right. No, we didn't. We didn't make it a component, but even the code right there is not deriving component. We'll probably have to take a look at that in a moment. Yeah, we'll have to take a look at that in a moment. Um, I'm going to press onward, though. It's really mad about that. But I, I'm torn on making that a component because I don't really think it should be a component. So I want to see if there's another solution coming down the pipeline. That's why I want to hold off. Despite how mad, oops, despite how mad it is, I want to hold off. So we're going to... Um, here we're extracting the map, the view shed, and the position, and we're going to get the this join is going to stay the same. We're going to get the view shed and position. We're going to join, and in this loop we're going to do view shed dot 
visible tiles dot clear you shed dot visible tiles dot uh, equal field of view it's going to be point new position dot x position dot y the range is going to be view shed dot range which we already baked into the type view shed dot range and the fov check is going to be okay dereferencing map there that's interesting okay i guess i guess what's happening is if, if this read storage only gave us a single map i guess we're just able to dereference it like that um and get the single map instead of having to do any other weirdness with it that's a specs thing so i need to look at how specs is handling that before i fully understand what's going on so we're doing a closure here so we're doing retain which should just let you use a closure to define only the things that you keep in the collection so p dot x greater equals zero and p dot x less than map dot width and p dot y is greater equals zero so we're just basically saying it has to be within the bounds Less than map dot height, and that's that. So, um, oops, it's still mad about this map, and we're gonna have to see what's going on with that. So, I'm gonna click back over and, and see if we get an explanation for how we're supposed to handle this because I don't really want to derive component for it. That just seems wrong. Oh, that's it. It's read expect. It's not read storage. That's what I'm missing. All right, let's fix that. Where is read expect? Let's read what read expect is because we haven't used that yet. Um, read expect allows to fetch a resource immutably. This will panic if the resource. Okay, so is write expect going to be the same thing? You can fetch a resource mutably. Yep, okay. So panic if it does not exist. You could also do write or option write. So, okay, so when they say expect, they're talking about typical um, Rust expect where you have like, well, it's the same idea kind of where it's like uh, let test equal some thing. <laughs> And then you would say test.expect. And then it returns the value or it panics. So I think that's that's why they're using the word expect there. Either get it or panic. Okay. So now back to the tutorial here. So there's quite a bit going on here, and the view shed's actually the simplest part. So we've added a read expect map, meaning that the system should be past our map for use. We used read expect because not having a map is a failure. Okay, I can buy that. In the loop, we first clear the list of visible tiles, which is going on here. Then we call RLTK's field of view function, providing the starting point, the location of entity from position. The range from the view shed and a slightly convoluted dereference, then get a reference to unwrap map from the ECS. Yeah, that was what I was kind of talking about there, where since we're getting just a single map there, I guess we, we dereference it, it gives us back the original map, and then we actually reference it. So we're, we're taking it out of the, the spec stuff, and we're just giving it a normal Rust reference instead of like the whatever the spec stuff has it wrapped in. And actually, let's take a look at whatever the spec stuff has it wrapped in so we can understand it. Um, so map, yeah, okay, so map gives us a read map panic handler so map dot so we can still access the map through that read but to get just the regular map like if i said let test equal um star map 
then it gives us back the map but we can't move out of the dereference um because it doesn't implement copy but we could i guess re-reference it right yeah so we can't move it out of that but we can do this as a cheeky way to get a reference to it okay So that's that. And then finally, we use the vectors retain method to delete any entries that don't meet the criteria we specify. This is a lambda or closure. It iterates over the vector, passing P as a parameter. If P is inside the map boundaries, we keep it. This prevents other functions from trying to access a tile outside of the working map area. We'll click back over there one time on that. Um, take a quick look at it. So yeah, this is what I was kind of already describing. And we can get the Rust description of retain. It retains only the elements specified by the predicate, which is a fancy way of saying, pass it a closure and give it essentially some Boolean thing in here. It's looking for something Boolean to decide true or false. And then depending on the, uh, like, whether it's true or false, tells it which things to keep. Wait, what are you talking about, Omnivore? <laughs> I'm, I might have missed something. Um, but yeah, depending on whether this thing returns true or false tells it what things stay in the vector. Um, so that's all that's going on there. So now this will run every frame, which is overkill, but we can do more on that later. And it stores a list of visible tiles. So we'll render visibility badly. <laughs> we'll do a poor job at it at first. And this is actually something I've commented on where um, if you're doing like game development or something, that's typically the right way to do it. Right is an opinionated word, but the idea is a lot of times in game development, you want to get something working so that you can then like refactor it. It's very easy in game development to try to over engineer from the beginning and say, well, I'm going to make sure everything is super optimized, but then you're never going to get anything happening because you need to, to kind of have things that are in your game world interacting and doing things to really understand how things are going to be properly optimized. Unless all you do every day is game development and you've been doing it for the past 20 years or something, right? Um, if you're kind of doing this more of a hobby, you probably do want to just kind of start out by getting something working and then like get hands on with it and figure out how you can make it better. Actually, just in general, a lot of times when, when people want to do game development, they think they're never ready for it. And they say, I would love to do that, but I need to learn more about this, or I need to do that first, or this first. And then you create this scenario where you'll, you'll never actually get started on any projects because you always think you need to learn more. You always think you're not ready. So um, one of the best advices in terms of game development is just start doing something. Open up Unreal Engine or, or Unity or whatever and just get a box moving around with the with the keyboard or something and and like doing that is more than a lot of people will ever do so anyway uh rendering visibility badly as a first try we'll change our draw map function to retrieve the map and the player's view shed it'll only draw tiles present in the view shed okay so let's take a look at draw map All right, so we have the map coming in, um, but we're actually going to do this with the with the ECS world, so we can just get them both from in here. So it's going to whoops, ECS world, and then we can grab them both instead of uh, explicitly passing in the map. So let mute view sheds, and we're going to do a. Um, ECS.write storage. So we're getting all the view sheds here. Um, maybe I cannot find world. Why not? Um, use specs, prelude. Now you can find world, right? Yeah, okay. And we're not getting view shed in here either, so from main use super rect view shed. That's gonna come in from main now. Okay. 
I want to stop it from being mad. Things it doesn't need to be mad about. So we're going to get right storage. Yeah, we're going to fetch that uh, view shed. It gets us every view shed or perhaps more appropriately, it gets us like the high bit set and everything associated with view sheds. Uh, we're going to do the same thing for players. And it's going to be player. And we're going to have to bring that one in as well. And we'll just make sure, obviously, map is good. OK. So we've got that satisfied. Um, we can't iterate over the map. So it's going to be dot tiles dot iter. We'll have to make that little change. Um, and then this X and Y are going to be used a little bit differently. So let me cut that. And we're going to iterate over. OK, we're going to smush this all up because we're going to do this for everything that has. Well, basically, we're just going to do it for the player. But the idea is we're going to do this for the player and the view shed. So let me find where this for loop terminates. Wrap this up in brackets. I think there's a, a nice shortcut for that, and I just never remember what it is. All right, so we're going to wrap that up. We're going to say for player view shed in, and this is where we're going to do the join. And players and view sheds join. And again, that's that's pretty efficient because of the way that that it handles the um, the high bit set stuff. But there are downsides to that. It's really interesting to read up on how that high bit set stuff works and how Specs uses it. So here, we say for tile in all the map tiles. Yep. Um, now before we do any match or anything. We want to say let pt equal point new x and y. So we're going to be incrementing these every time we go through the loop. So that's going to represent where we're at on the map. And if you shed dot visible tiles dot contains the point. Oh, whoops. Then we're going to do all that match and stuff. So it's going to be open there and close after the match. So only if it's a visible tile will, will we draw it. We have it. So now we can try running the example. Make sure I didn't break anything. I did break something. Oh, right. Because where we're calling draw, um, it's no longer this, it is self, not self, um, self dot world or no self dot ECS. And it's actually, yeah, there we go. We no longer pass the map in the map is coming in through the self.ecs. So we run it now and we have graphics. <laughs> we have a game again. It's not broken anymore. So if you run the example now, it'll show you just what the player can see. There's no memory and performance is quite awful, but it's there and about right. Actually, performance is eh, it's fast enough. It's not fast enough if you want to make this a complex game, but it works, holy moly. <laughs> Alrighty, yeah. So that's already cool for like a simple field of view. Um, but we got to make it better, right? Of course. So it's clear we're on the right track, but we need a more efficient way to do things. That's what the tutorial says here. It'd be nice if the player could remember the map as they see it too. So we're going to expand the map to include revealed tiles. 
To simulate map memory, we'll extend our map class to include a revealed tiles structure. It's just a boolean for each tile on the map. If true, then we know what's there. Our map definition now looks like this, so easy enough to add a single field, except everything's going to be mad be where we're initializing it, right, for obvious reasons that we need to then uh, add that new field. So pub reveal tiles vec bool and we look for where it's mad. So revealed tiles. Um, we're going to explicitly initialize this to false, right? So um, it's 80 by 50. Again, I don't like, I feel like we're, we're typing that too many times. I feel like we should be um, bringing that in as, a, as an argument rather than um, hard coding that, but we'll probably change it one day, right? It's probably gonna change one day. All right, I, I, I'd like to try this on the uh, old map function as well. That's why I'm maintaining it and keeping up with it, even though the tutorial kind of threw it away now. I'd like to just test it on the different maps, but I know the tutorial is gonna get to that at some point later with different uh, map generation algorithms and stuff, so we'll get to that. So, see so we add revealed tiles as a, a, a vector of bools we extend the current function that fills the map to include the new type and we just initialize everything to false that adds a false value for every tile we change draw map to look at this value rather than iterating the component each time so then the function is going to be altered even more so draw map where'd you go We're gonna take the world in, we get view sheds. Uh, actually, we're not getting the, not getting the view shed right now, but. Oh, cause we're gonna handle that elsewhere, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, we're handling that elsewhere now. So we'll just fetch the map. And we don't need to do this join or anything, so. Get rid of that. It's funny, like, we get one thing working and then immediately, like, delete all that. Do it differently. Um, but no, it makes sense why. Like, fine. Or index and tile. So we're going to enumerate. And we don't need this point here anymore. We're basically going to be moving this code elsewhere. That's the idea. So if map dot revealed So if that index is true in our revealed tiles, then it says that it has been revealed and we draw it. So if we go here, we get a black screen or something, right? Yeah. We get a black screen, but I could, st I'll still like, I can't move left anymore because I'm hitting a wall. Um, now the reason is hopefully fairly clear. We're not actually changing revealed tiles yet, right? So we're gonna have to move the code that, well, that's the idea is we're moving the code that actually modifies what tiles are revealed with the view shed and everything to elsewhere to make it a little more make the logic a little more separated from the drawing of the map because they are two different concepts right the drawing of the map should not be modifying the data of like like what's revealed and not revealed so yeah this will render a black screen because we're never setting any tiles to be revealed so now we extend the visibility system to know how to mark tiles as revealed to do this, it has to check to see if an entity is the player, and if it is, it updates the map's revealed status. And that makes sense. We have a system called visibility system, so that should be what's handling that logic. Why not? So, I got there's a lot to look at here, so I got to make sure I'm not missing anything. Um, map position, view shed, and player now. Field of view and point, and we need the specs prelude. All that's good. Um, so system data is now a larger tuple and it starts with write expect 
and it has the map. Then we do entities. Which actually, that's a specs thing. It's just a wrapper for read entities resource. Hmm. We'll see how that works. I'm not familiar with that. Um, this is my first time using specs, so there's a lot of learning here. So we'll see how entities is being used. Um, write storage view shed is next. So what is this? Oh, whoops. Not what I intended. There we are. Write storage view shed. And then position. And we no longer have this map. We have a read storage player. Alrighty, that's a big old tuple right there. And we're going to have a mutable map now because this is what contains the revealed tiles. So let mute map. And entities is next. And mute view shed. Position. And lastly, player. All that is equal to data. We're using the, the Rust way of destructuring the tuple. Unfortunately, it does not want to split this onto other lines, so we're going to manually do that. But if I format it, yeah, it's going to go back. Because, like, the linter doesn't see all this extra stuff that's being added in, right? That's being... These types are being added in by, like, Rust Analyzer and everything. So the linter's like, oh, that line's short enough. But my terminal's like, no, it's not. Or my editor's like, no, it's not, bro. Hey, take it easy. Thanks for stopping in. And, uh, quick little chat and uh, the follow and everything. Hope you have a good one. So, okay, we destructure that tuple into all these different things. And then the loop is going to be for ent you shed position in and entities mute view shed and position dot join so now we do view shed dot visible tiles dot clear and we do the field of view again um is anything changing there point new position x and y view shed range and map. Okay, nothing special there. Retain is p.x greater or equal zero. p.x less than map width. p.y greater or equal zero and p.y less than map height. So all that's good for retaining. Uh, but now we have some extra extra stuff going on. Some extra juicy goodness in here. Let's check it out. So if this is the player, reveal what they can see. So let p option player will player dot get entity or get int. Okay. So we are pulling this for okay. Tries to read the data associated with an entity. So this is only going to... Okay, I think I see what's happening. I'll, pr I'll probably break this down because there's some kind of implicit stuff happening here. This is actually like a bit of an, a bit of an extra conditional like kind of built in here that we're not having to check because of the way that Specs does this. We are still checking it, but it's the way we're checking it that's a little odd. So we're going to get that index and we're going to do map.revealedtiles index is true. And we can mm, we can underline this or uh, underscore that so it's not mad. Um okay. Yeah, so it looks like this player here, we got to ask the question first, where is it coming from? It's coming from up here in this big, long conditional, but really it's coming from this type system data, 
This is where the, this is the first place we trace it back to. We're defining system data here, and that's the data that the system requires to run. And so one of these things is read storage to the player component, right? Um, when we do this tuple destructure here, the last thing we do is get player from it. So it's that read storage. If we mouse over here, we see storage, player, and then it's got this fetch mask storage and stuff in it. Um, I'm not going to bother with breaking down all those types, but we have that player there that's being defined as the system data, one of the different components we're asking for. And then we do player.get ent, which is an entity, tries to read the data associated with an entity. So I think I understand this now. So back here, I was like, what is this thing here? A wrapper for a read entities resource. Note that this is, this is just read entities, so you can easily use it in your system. Well, remember that in an entity component system, an entity is basically just an ID. It's not actually anything special. It's just like a number, it's an ID. So what it's probably doing is under the hood, it's really just giving us like an ID. So when we say player.get this entity, we're actually passing it an ID. And we don't know if we're gonna get anything when we do this. It tries to read the data associated with an, with an entity. So if we're running this and we have another entity that's not the player, we have a monster or something, um, then we're not actually going to get anything here because that entity value is gonna be, let's say monster is 47, it's gonna say, and, and the player is 12, then it's gonna say, you know, player.get 47, and it's like, well, 47 is not 12, so obviously that's not the player. It's gonna give us back a none. That's an interesting way of doing this. And then we do the Rust if let syntax as a way to say, if there is something in there, let's do some work with it. Um, rather than doing like match P and then putting in the two arms for some and none, since we don't want to do anything if there's a none, the if let syntax works well for that. Um, so then that's that's a, a very interesting and weird way to check if we're looking at the player. An analogous way to do this would be if we had two variables, like, like let me just kind of redefine what it is real quick. Um, let's say we have const player ID. Um, oh yeah, that's fine. Const player ID u size equal 12 and then we have um, let int u size equal 12 it would almost be like saying that right like if int equal equal player ID and then doing some work with it but what's interesting about this and what's exciting about it to me is that this allows as we already described other things can have fields of vision and so this is, is something that already kind of lets us decouple that logic a little bit and maybe allow other things to have some visibility, to have their own fields of vision. So I, I think that, that may be related here, except this, because it is a visibility system. Yeah, so it, it may end up being used in that context later. So we'll actually see what happens, but... I wanted to break that down, part again, partially for me to understand it, but also because I think there's some interesting stuff going on here. So we have that system updated now. Um, and yeah, I'm not gonna read over the code because I just, I just typed it all out and talked about a lot of it, so we'll just skip on. The main changes here are that we're getting the entities list along with the components and obtaining read-only access to the player's storage. We add those to the list of things to iterate in the list and add a let p option and player equal player dot get int to see if this is the player. The rather cryptic if let sum p equal p runs only if there's a player component. Then we calculate the index and mark it revealed. If you run if you run the project now, it mass, it's massively faster than the previous version and remembers where you've been. So let's check it out. Yep, it is definitely remembering where I've been. <laughs> I don't, don't have much else to say on that right now. Um, so just a, a point to, you know, 
a chance to reiterate this point, I guess, is I recently did another roguelike tutorial um, with Rust and TCOD or LibTCOD. And I, I finished that up like a, I don't know, a week ago or something or a week and a half ago now. So that is on my YouTube channel. Actually, I think it'll be going live in a couple days um, next week. If I finish it up, there's like a two week delay. So if you're interested in seeing that, but the reason I bring it up is because there is, uh, the initial design of this game is gonna be very similar to that other tutorial. And then this tutorial is gonna go heavily into like algorithms and stuff, uh, like different map generation algorithms. I, I saw, you know, there's one on binary space partitioning, which is like very legit technology in terms of uh, game development. It was used in Doom back in the day. Um, so, like, it's going to go into a lot more, like, hardcore stuff, if you will, uh, than the other tutorial did. But a lot of what's going on here is going to be very similar to that other tutorial, but the code here is a lot different. The code is very different, and I do like this code a lot more. It Just something about it, it feels more structured, and it feels already a little more in-depth, but it's still doing the same things. So anyway, uh, and, and it's using a more proper ECS, which is big. I, I like that. Um, okay, back to the browser. So speeding it up even more, recalculating visibility when we need to. Okay, so this is probably going to go back to what they mentioned earlier. We're running this every frame, and you probably don't want to do that, right? So it's still not as efficient as it could be. Let's only update view sheds when we need to. So let's add a dirty flag to our view shed component. <laughs> It is dirty. I like that. You got the dirty bit, right? That's a uh, a legitimate term, like something called a dirty bit. But it's always funny. Like, it's a funny name. So who's mad? Main's mad? Yeah. And basically, what we're probably going to do... Uh, not bull. Um, what we're... Pro Actually, would it start out as true? Yeah, it does start out as true. I was like, yeah, because then that's going to force it to update. What we're probably going to do is is maybe factor it in with the player movement. And I, I'm looking now and I do see that. Um, basically, the only time we need to update our field of view is when we move. So that's what the dirty thing means is like, hey, it's dirty. We need to recalculate it, right? So um, we'll update the initialization in main to say it's dirty. <laughs> I like that. To say that the view shed is, in fact, dirty. Uh, our system can be extended to check if the dirty flag is true and only recalculate if it is, and set the dirty flag to false when it is done. Now we need to set the flag when the player moves, because what they can see is changed. We can update try move player in player.rs. So try move player. Um, we got to do a little extra fetching now, so let mute view sheds equal ECS dot right storage, and we're going to get the, uh, the view shed out of that. And basically, let's see, player position and view shed. So we're going to do a join here. And the reasoning behind that would be other things can have it. Remember, this is a component, so other things can have view sheds. All right, so we do the destination, all that cool stuff. Basically, right after we do the move, we do view shed dot dirty equal true. We like it nice and dirty. And it should be pretty familiar by now. We've added view sheds to get right storage and included it in the list of component types we're iterating. Then one call sets the flag to true after a move. Game now runs very fast once more if you type cargo run. But in my case, it doesn't because the tutorial did not actually uh, set the system to only calculate it if we need to or to, um, to only run the visibility system. Is that what it is? Let me double check. Um, our system can be extended to check if dirty flag is true and only recalculate. Yeah, so the calculating is happening here. Um, hmm. 
this is the whole recalculation bit. So if I, whoops, that's not what I wanted. There we go. If view shed dot dirty, and then at the end of it, we'll say view shed dot dirty equal false. And everything still works, but now we're only calculating that when we need to. Simple enough. So yeah, the game runs fast. If you type cargo run, all right, we're good. Let's get back over here to the browser. So graying out what we remember but can't see. So this is very common in roguelikes. You know, I've been playing a lot of Cataclysm Dark Days Ahead. You get that kind of grayed out memory on things that you can't currently see, but you just looked at or like you have knowledge of. So we're gonna be implementing that. So one more extension, we'd like to render parts of the map we know are there but can't currently see. So we add a list of what tiles are currently visible to map. So it's gonna be another bool just like the last one. And our creation method also needs to know how to add, needs to know to add all false to it just like before. So visible tiles, vec, false. Yeah, our map, okay, yeah, yeah, that's right. Invisibility system will clear the list of visible tiles before we begin iterating and mark currently visible ones as we find them. So our code to run when updating view shed looks like this. And then that'll, yeah, that's basically confirming. Although I did have a question and I was, I was gonna have to break it down of whether or not we should include this in here. And, and it actually turns out we should. Um, we should put that in the view shed dot dirty. Um, oh, because we're updating the map, of course, yeah. All right, so I'll make sure to make that change as well. Um, if I had looked, I probably would have noticed, or probably would have caught that. We're updating the map and uh, with the revealed tiles and everything, so we definitely don't want to do that if we don't need to. Um, all righty. So let's go to the... Um, La Mapa? La Mapa? Where are you at? And instead of revealed tiles, it's visible tiles. And now who's mad? You're mad. Visible tiles. Um, the one down here. Ah. There we go, and our system. So where are we gonna deal with that? Who's mad process is the best. <laughs> I, that's I, How else are you supposed to refactor, right? Like, do you expect me to actually look for it? <laughs> that's, no, that is legitimately like the easiest way. Um, Rust is very good about helping you too. It's like, hey, you did this thing here, but it's like now named a little bit differently. You know, are you sure this is what it should be? All right, so we're doing visible tiles. Um, all that's good. Revealed and visible tiles here. <laughs> exactly like you get to a point where you realize it's not worth trying to do it the right way because it's like I'd rather just just do this <laughs> just get it over with all right visible tiles I don't think we're using mapped up visible tiles anywhere else right now oh no we are doing one thing with it here before this we're um for t in map dot visible tiles dot iter mute we're changing them. Right, we, we reset everything and then we calculate it. Got it. I really like too, though, speaking of the who's mad approach, is that I can see on my tabs at the top, like, oh, this file is mad. So it, it's really good. Um, it, like separating all the logic it doesn't make it that much more difficult to find where you have problems when you have a, a nice IDE like that that kind of helps you out. 
you know, if you're doing everything in um, Vim or something, and I mean, okay, if you're doing everything in like a non highly customized Vim, like a default vanilla Vim, you probably do want to be careful about it. <laughs> but if you're if you've got like a highly customized Vim, I mean, it does all this same stuff basically. And you can be lazy. We do have great tools, yeah. I mean, when I was first learning, it was all like Vim and stuff. Uh, it didn't have to be, but all our stuff had to run on the, the computer science machines, like the, the they called them the CSE machines at school. And it was like these shared servers, basically. And if it ran on that and passed the tests and everything, that was what mattered, right? It didn't matter if it ran on your home computer, because if they can't run it on the school system, then they assume it doesn't work, right? So like you'd always be testing on there and there was there was a lot of like you're just using Vim and everything because they're just like raw Linux machines with no no desktop or anything, right? You SSH in and go to town. And we didn't have I say it like it was a long time ago, it wasn't, but we didn't have like remote remote SSH back then, like the uh, VS Code plugin. We didn't even have, we didn't even have VS Code. It came out a little bit after I was doing all that. Um, okay, so I think we're happy there. I think everything is good. I'm not seeing anything I'm missing. Because the only thing that, that we care about, whether it's dirty or not, is the view shed. And then that adjusts both of the tiles, visible and uh, revealed. So now draw map has a little bit of additional logic. Because we're actually going to draw them as a different color, right? So, what we're going to do is, when we loop through and we match, if map.revealed tiles, we match on the tile. Okay, now we're going to also change the glyph, perhaps. Let glyph, let mute foreground. <laughs> Jogging some memories from a long time ago. Yeah, we did, um, We at my school we started with C and then went to C++, and those were really the only things that we, like, as a computer science student, were guaranteed to learn. That, that and some assembly. Um, and then everything else, if you came across another language, it was because you took a specific course that may or may not have talked about it, or you did it on your own. Um, so, like, everyone was doing, like, C and, and C++. And this is actually something I really like about Rust because it, it's mad because it doesn't know what glyph is, but we're going to be assigning to it at some point, so it's going to be fine. It's going to be happy later. Um, <laughs> just make it happy, right? Um, it's probably just going to be a character, but, you know, Rust lets us be a little lazy at times, so we, we be lazy when we can, I guess. Uh, so tile type floor, set the context. Um... No, we're se oh okay. I see what we're doing. Yeah, that's actually nice. Instead of separate calls, we're setting the the distinct data for um we're setting all the like unique data that can differ based on the match, and then we're gonna do a single call down here. So we'll go ahead and slide that out of there, and this is instead of this color that we're setting hard coding right here. This is going to be the foreground color. We still hard code the background, the BG. And then the glyph. Now, if you watch up there where glyph is mad, it's about to be happy. Not yet. Still didn't figure it out. Usually, it, that's good enough because it knows what's being passed in here. Guess not. But these are weird, they're all... Yeah, it's weird. I don't know why they're in all caps like that. Uh, we'll, we'll, it'll figure it out in a minute. If not map dot visible tiles index. Oh, I know why it's not resolving some of this. Yeah, now it's managed to resolve that. But it's starting to see the way that we're using things. It's getting a little bit more context. So if map is 
if it's not a visible tile, we set it to grayscale. We set the foreground to grayscale. Okay. Then back up here, we need to do something for floor. Two CP four thirty seven. We do a dot. We'll paste this over this, and this is going to be pound sign or a hash or whatever you call it. I still call it pound sign because that's what I grew up calling it. I don't know why they mix the formats here. I'm following it because the tutorial gods tell me so. But I don't know why they mix the formats, like 0.0, .0 versus 0. Dot. I find it weird to omit the the zero after the dot. Like it may be valid, but I do find that to be a bit of a weird syntax. So we should now. Unless I broke something. Yeah. Yeah, we got gray stuff where we used to be. Looks like a proper roguelike now. Well, that's it. I mean, we kind of, we already, we beat the game. We won. Let's just stop now. We don't need to do anything else. Random maps and FOV and memory and all that. Yeah, it's fun, right? Okay, now that, it's good, but we got to do more. So yeah, if you cargo run now, you'll have visible tiles as slightly cyan floors and green walls and gray. Yeah, uh, visible tiles are slightly cyan floors and green walls, and they turn gray as they move out of view. So very cool, clap. Performance should be great. Congrats, you now have a nice working field of view system. And we're also going to go through monsters today, and that'll take up the rest of the time. Uh, so chapter six, monsters. There's no way I'm doing dealing damage after this because that's going to take a while. We're going to add, I, I guarantee we're probably going to be adding, well, yeah, no, we might add some new components. We're going to have to do it when we get to dealing damage for sure. We probably add some components here though. Um, so yeah, chapter six, monsters. A roguelike with no monsters is quite unusual. So let's add some. The good news is we've already done some of the work for this. We can render them. We can calculate what they can see. We'll build on the source from the previous chapter and get some harmless monsters into play. So we'll render a monster in the center of each room. We can simply add a renderable component for each monster. We'll also add a view shed since we'll use it later. And our main function, add this following. So we're gonna iterate through the rooms, get the center value and use that to place down a monster. So we do it before we insert the map because we're essentially borrowing from the map in order to do this uh, iteration. So for room in map.rooms.iter.skip1. I already know why we're doing that. Um, that says to skip the first thing and skip the first n elements. The center of the first room is where the player spawns. So we don't want to kill the player or like spawn two things in the same place or whatever. So we're going to get the room.center and then it's just going to be spawning. Create entity with a position and with a renderable component. Give me the easy fields. What do they look like? RLTK to that, we give it a G. A goblin or something right and RGB named RLTK red this one's gonna be very similar okay and it's also with a view shed visible tiles so now they have a knowledge of some visible tiles. They have a range that they can see, and they're also very, very dirty. Oh my. <laughs> see, I already kind of called how that was going to happen. 
where by by using the view shed the way we did, that's going to allow them to also have that field of view and and just like the player and be able to use that in their AI, basically be able to use that in, in how they attack or move or something. So we'll see that come into play later, I'm sure. And so we insert the map and everything's good. So we have monsters now, we won. So notice the skip to ignore the first room. We don't want the player starting with a mob on top of him, her, it. Running this cargo run produces something like this. Well, let's take a look at it. Yeah, see what's cool? Like this is this is like where the ECS starts to shine because all I did was say, hey, put some more entities in the game. They're renderable. I just told you what they like how they render you know by saying here's the glyph here's the color the foreground and background color like here's the position and it just renders it like that's that's nice like you're not having to do any extra logic at that point because we've already got the systems in play to handle it so i mean that's that's where it kind of shines through a little bit i'm a fan of that so that's a really good start. However, we're rendering monsters even if we can't see them. We probably only want to render the ones we can see, unless they've got like glowing eyes or something, like when you wake up in the middle of the night on Dwarf Fortress Adventure Mode, and there's all the glowing eyes looking at you. We can do this by modifying our render loop. Let's take a look at it. Um, that's in here in tick, right? Yeah. So, let positions and render rules. Now we're going to get the map. So we're going to fetch the map, la mappa. And for position, render and positions and renderables dot join. Let index. I am tempted to refactor all this and get away from the IDX convention because something about it bothers me. It's like, it's just a couple more characters. And only if it's visible, if map.visible tiles IDX. That's a stylistic choice, the variable naming, but something about I don't know, something about it's weird to me. So now we run it again. And suddenly we don't see the monsters. But if I go into another room, we see a monster. We can walk over it and stuff because there's no logic there for that. But we can see two monsters at once. I'm terrified. I'm so scared right now. Okay. So we get the, mm, let's see, yeah. We get the map from the ECS, use it to obtain an index and check if the tile is visible. If it is, we render the renderable. There's no need for a special case for the player since they can generally be expected to see themselves. The result is pretty good. Now we're gonna add some monster variety. So it's rather dull to only have one monster type. So we'll amend our monster spawner to be able to create G oblins and O or, O orcs. <laughs> let's try to read it how it's written. Make goblins and orcs. Here's the spawner code. All right. So now we're going to be making a random number generator and stuff and actually working with it a little bit. So where is... Where is the code? So here's where we're spawning them. So I assume, yeah, before we do the iteration, because we don't want to make a new random number generator every time, that'd be dumb. So let mute RNG equals RLTK uh, random number generator new many many ways you could do this um, I really like the way that it was done in the other tutorial where we did the weighted stuff by the end of the tutorial um, I've used that in some other projects I've done um, the like the weighted random number generation it's all relative so if you tell something like this has a weight of 10 and this other thing has a weight of 20 you're not like adding up percentages to make a hundred you're saying this thing is twice as likely to appear as the other thing so then you could make something with like an obscene difference in weight 
And it's, it's really easy. It's a really easy way to factor in like a lot of different items without having to worry so much about like, oh, this thing, you know, all of these things have to add up to 100%. So we have to like do math and, and like, no, 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 just put some weights on them. Like you, that math is easier is what I'm trying to say. You don't have to like figure out these precise numbers um, to like break apart a hundred percent into like very precise values. So let X Y room center. Now we're gonna okay. We're gonna set the glyph. Font care type. Let roll equal roll rng dot roll dice. We're gonna roll one d two. Match roll. So if we get a one, then we do glyph equal RLTK two. And we do a goblin, a gablin. Otherwise, we do an orc. Ooh. Did something funky there. An orc. An orc. Alrighty. You know what? You know what's a little more rusty though? Because <laughs> this just returns um, font care type. You know what you do instead? Instead of this glyph.equal, let glyph equal match role. Boom. Whatever you want, like either one works. Also notice we did not make glyph mutable there. However, it did let us assign immutable variables. You can still assign them later on. So you could do what we saw here where you have multiple branches that can each assign, but you can only assign once. So either way works though. Um, Rust lets you treat like almost anything you want as an expression. So we can take this whole match statement and because we're not putting like semicolons here or anything, these basically flow back up to outside of the match statement. And so we have to put a semicolon on the end here because this is actually the end of this whole thing, which is being assigned to glyph. I just feel like that's a little more rusty than doing it the other way. Eh, you know, fun to mess with. And after that... We just pass in glyph here, which I think, can we just do this? Yeah, so this is another Rust thing. So this is valid, right? Glyph, glyph. But because it has the same name, see this here, it's saying shorthand struct initialization. Um, it, and if I have it autocomplete, it just gives us glyph. And that's a, a particular Rust thing where, so normally what you do is you have the name of the field. So renderable has a glyph field. And then you have like my glyph, whatever the variable name is, right? Well, if the names happen to match like they do in this case, you can omit that and just put the name once and it figures it out. Whether you like that or not, it's up to you, but it's a thing. Things are cool sometimes. Everything else I, I think is identical. All we're really doing they don't have any unique behaviors or anything so if we run it we should see goblins and orcs there's an o so we already know that one's working and there's a g not much to it right very straightforward very easy to get different monsters out there at the same time so obviously when we start adding in combat, we'll want more variety, but it's a good start. Run the program and you'll see roughly 50-50 split between orcs and gablins. So now we want to make the monsters think. Oh my god, Epic Game Store just popped up like... <laughs> it's just like, you don't see it, but like it, it just really wants me to know about like pre-purchasing Goat Simulator 3 and Star Trek and Fall Guys. Like, you know, calm down. Calm down, bro. Making the monsters think. Now to start making the monsters think. For now, they won't actually do much beyond pondering their lonely existence. 
We should start by adding a tag component to indicate that an entity is a monster. In components.rs, we add a simple struct, and then we'll need to register it. We, we should also amend our, monster, our spawning code to apply it to monsters as well. So we'll take care of all of those. Let's get into components and add that new one here. So this is something I was expecting that now monsters have unique behaviors and stuff. So it's going to be tied to that component. But I think it's going to get really interesting. I think... Yeah, I already see the next bit. It's going to get pretty interesting. Um, so in main... Oh, they also derive debug. So I guess we might be debug printing it at some point. We'll see what happens. Um, so what do we do? Yeah, we're going to register the component. So we'll just do that and rename it. And then where we make the monster... We'll add another dot with monster. There we are. So let's see. Now we make a system for monster thought. We'll make a new file, monster AI system. Monster monster AI system dot rs. We'll give it some basically non-existent intelligence. I'm going to be really lazy on my use statements here and just copy paste them from the tutorial because I don't feel like dealing with those. I don't like copy pasting code, but like a couple of use statements, like ah, whatever. Like I sometimes I'll copy paste the comments because like I don't feel like typing them. But I always say if you're following a tutorial, do type the code yourself because there is a lot to be learned from that. So we're going to make a monster AI struct and it's a system. So we have to do this whole like ugly system. <laughs> like the way you impl system is not the like nicest looking thing, but it's not horrible. We're going to impl system for monster AI type system data. Actually, so is system data, let's see. No, I'm curious if system data is something that we're doing for cleanliness or if it's required. FN run and mute self data. Could I not say like read storage? Just a little exercise and we'll copy move this around when I'm done. Uh, read storage. So some traits have required like types that you have to implement. Uh, when you're adding things together, for instance, you have an output type that you have to specify. And you do that because two things, when added together, um, might actually produce something different. So you are required to add, implement that output type. And yeah, it looks like we're able to get away with doing this, but that's a big, long, like nasty tuple. So we end up replacing that with system data. And we do type system data equals that big, long, nasty tuple. VS Code is, is indeed great. You've been switching over to it for some of your projects. Can't believe <laughs> uh Oh, wait, something. Hold on, I got to click over to OBS for this. It, wow. The, the stream manager on the phone edited sucker. He says, can't believe how... Like, I had a hard time reading it anyway. The phone's, like, really tiny. And I was like, did you say Russell? No. <laughs> Can't believe how versatile and powerful the sucker is. But it's censored sucker. <laughs> Just put a bunch of stars. <laughs> My Something in the other room was talking. Um, so, you do all your TypeScript in VS Code. Yeah, that's actually uh, the first time I saw people, like, seriously using VS Code. It was TypeScript um, back at one of my old jobs. I had heard about it, but I was kind of scared off from it because the way people talked about it, they're like, you have to like literally program your settings and stuff. And I was like, that doesn't sound, that doesn't sound pleasant. And when I started getting seriously into Rust, this is like what pretty much everyone uses. And I became a convert very quickly. 
Um, so anyway, um, where are we at on the system? So yeah, system data is not required. We're doing it, I guess, for cleanliness, so we can just pass in data here, and it's a little less ugly looking. Um, or so we can just pass it in as, as like a... It still has to be called data um, to uh, satisfy the, uh, the impl block, but the contract, if you will. But... Um, a lot cleaner to say system data than it is to say this big ass tuple every time <laughs> and then if you change the tuple it just kind of gets baked into this so yeah there's there's benefits to it i guess so we're going to get the view shed position and the monster out of that we're not mutating anything we're not using the monster but we need to make sure these are linked up with monsters <laughs> the monster considers their own existence. I love it. I absolutely love it. That's that's their logic for now. Exactly. Faster than Visual Studio in, in a lot of cases. Yeah, in most cases. Um, you get as much feedback. Like, yeah, it... it is it built on Electron or something else? I don't remember what it's built on, but it is very responsive and very configurable. I love it. Yeah, bloat versus compiling and runtime, yeah. I mean, I think what's cool about it is if you if you get past like the initial like fright of, of how configurable it is, it's so much better because you can really like do whatever you want with it. like. It's good in a way that, like, by default, it doesn't come with a lot because then you can just put what you want on there, right? So, like, you might look at it and be like, oh, that sucks. It doesn't come with this. It doesn't come with that. But no, VS Code is like, you put what you want in there. You make it your own. And then that means you don't have 87 features that you're never going to use that slow it down, right? All right, so we've got a system in place. Uh, we, we get... View sheds, positions, and monsters, and we loop over all the entities that have those, and we just log that the monster considers their own existence. I just got stumped on something. What the hell is is console.log a thing we could just do? What? Where's console coming from? Is it an RL? It's not giving me any information here as we just got done talking about VS Code. Now it's it's mad. It's mad at me. <laughs> I think that's an RLTK console. Hold on. Reload window. Okay, give it a moment. Yeah, I think console's coming in through RLTK because I'm, I'm like, I'm not familiar with any other, with any console log. Why is it? Something weird's going on. We literally just got done talking about how nice VS Code is and right now it's not like auto-completing anything. Hmm. I'll worry about it in a minute. I'll give it some time behind the scenes to see if it works itself out. Actually, what is unused variable I? Get rid of that. I'm tired of that being yellow. Unused imports. I 
Okay, I think we're good. Let me just check in here real quick. Okay, we're good in here. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. RLTK console. I just keep typing it. Yeah, there's something weird with the RLTK stuff. It's not resolving, I guess. Figure it out. All right. Enough being distracted by that. So now that we're... Note that we're importing console from RLTK. Okay, yeah. Dude, if I only read... <laughs> if only I read ahead literally... Like, what is that? Five words? <laughs> oh, well. Note that we're importing console from RLTK and printing with console log. This is a helper provided by RLTK that, de that detects if you're compiling to a regular program or a web assembly. If you're using a regular program, it calls print line and outputs to the console. If you're in web assembly, it outputs to the browser console. We'll also extend the system runner in main.rs to call it. Okay, yeah, because we made this new system. We actually have to use it. Um, run systems. So we get the visibility system, let mute mob equal monster AI. Mob.run now and self.ecs. And monster AI is not being pulled in yet, so we'll have to do the thing here. Mod monster AI system. Use monster AI system. We're actually going to take visibility system and star it. Okay. So if we run it now... Uh-oh, who's mad? Why, why are you mad? Great objects must contain... The dine keyword. What did I miss on that system data? Type system data equals. Oh. Self system data. There we go. Oh, yeah, and if you look. The console is freaking out and just spamming that the monster ponders, considers their own existence. It's actually still going. Might not look like it, but it's just spamming. Scroll back. It's completely just filled up the terminal with that. Um, but that's to be expected. That's what we expected when we're just calling that over and over and not limiting it or anything, right? So there's our system. If we run it now, it'll be very slow and the console will fill up with monster considers their own existence. The AI is running, but it's running every tick. So this is going to be a turn-based game in a tick-based world. To prevent this and make a turn-based game, we introduce a new concept to the game state. The game is either running or waiting for input, so we make an enum to handle this. And we'll derive a couple things for it as well. We'll put it right around state. We're not using those things for now, but we'll keep them there. Because I think we're going to. So we'll do it before state. It doesn't matter in Rust. You could put things before or after. It's not like C. All right, so we have paused and running in our run state, and then our state has this run state. We add it to the state structure, um, but there's some extra information about why we derived what we derived. So notice the derive macro. Derivation is a way to ask Rust and crates to add code to your structure for you to cut down on typing boilerplate. In this case, the enum needs a few extra features. Partial EQ allows you to compare the run state with other run state variables to determine if they are 
excuse me, determine if they're the same or different. Uh, copy marks it as a copy type. It can be safely copied in memory, meaning it has no pointers that will be messed up doing this. Uh, clone quietly adds a dot clone function to it, allowing you to make a memory copy that way. So next, we need to add it to the state structure. So yeah, we just did that. Um, and in turn, we need to amend our state creator to include a run state. We're gonna call it running, we're gonna, or we're gonna make it currently running. And then we'll also have to change the tick function to only run the simulation when the game isn't paused, and otherwise to ask for user input. So where is the state being created? Well. Question is, where is it mad? <laughs> so we'll start it as running. And then the tick function. Uh, let's see, I think all of that is basically the same. So yeah, we go up here. If self.run state equal run state running then we run systems and we do we make it paused so basically we run the systems a single time and then we pause it otherwise we wait for, we, we ask for player input. And then maybe something happens, maybe something doesn't. Um, so somewhere else, like in the player input, we're gonna have to modify the run state. Um, and actually we're gonna, yeah, we're gonna do that here by saying self dot, dot run state equal player input. Now player input's mad because um, we don't pull assignment up. Oh, no, <laughs> I see what it's doing, but no. Take me to it. No, go right, F12 does it. So we'll go to player input and we need to make this return that run state. Um, I think we're probably, yeah, we're just gonna make it do a run state. Um, doesn't need to be optional because it'll just stay paused otherwise. Um, so on each of these, now we probably, yeah, so we want to do return run state paused. Otherwise, um, we get through this match. We do run state running. And now, if we do cargo run, everything still works. Still a little bit slow. I'm pressing down a bunch. So I may have, okay, now it's running fast. Now it's slow. Okay, we need to take a look and make sure I didn't miss anything. Because um, they're still going kind of ham. <laughs> they're still going crazy. So let us uh, let me double check. Make sure I didn't miss anything here. So in main, if run state running, then we run systems, and then we pause. Else, we ask for player input. Player input now returns a state. So we go back to player input. And we try to move the player, all that's fine. In this case, we return run state paused. In this case, we return run state running. That's all fine, I wonder why it was slow. I'm holding left right, yeah. I was holding left and it wasn't moving. I'm holding up right now and 
Hmm. I wonder what that's about. Unless it's just not reading the input properly. I wonder if there's an issue with... I'm holding right. There we go. But I, I feel like I would have noticed that before. I want to put a debug statement in here real quick. Just a simple debug statement to say, like running systems. I want to make sure this isn't running more than it's supposed to. My console, no, it is running over and over, so self.run state is paused. So some, yeah, something's off. Because I didn't move around at all and we got running systems over and over and over again. So if self dot run state double equal, I didn't do a, a I didn't do a, a a bad right there. <laughs> self dot run systems. Did I miss something in? Um... No, we don't do it in run systems. We change it to paused right here self.run state equal run state paused oh was that enough to break it no hmm i did miss that there and it was kind of feeding it back out of the conditional self.run state Equal player input self in context. So the only other place that like comes to mind is the player input. Unless I'm doing something really dumb that I'm missing. I mean we could put this in brackets, but you shouldn't need to do that. Nope. Still spamming. Oh, I missed an obvious thing, didn't I? I missed the nun. Didn't I? <laughs> yeah, I was like, that's stupid. You wouldn't need to put brackets. Hey, things happen. Things happen like that, right? Now we're good. Now we're not getting that anymore. Yeah, because when I... Like, it was doing that all the time, even when I wasn't pressing anything. Now we're where we need to be. Got it. All right. So, yeah. Um, what do we do? So, the tick function... If the game is running, we run systems, and then we pause. Otherwise, we set the run state to whatever player input gives us. And player input, don't miss the none branch, gives us paused if we don't press anything, or if we press an invalid key. Otherwise, if we do press a valid key, we fall through and return running there at the end. So that's it. Um, game's back up to speed, and the monsters only think about what to do when you move. That's a basic turn-based tick loop. So quiet monsters until they see you. You could let monsters think every time anything moves, and you probably will when you get into deeper simulation. But for now, let's quiet them down a bit and have them react if they can see the player. It's highly likely that systems will often want to know where the player is, so let's add that as a resource. In main, put one 
one line puts it in. I don't recommend doing this for non-player entities. There are only so many resources available, but the player is one we use over and over again. Alrighty. So, where do we want to do this? gs.ecs.insert. Oh, are we going to have to manage this? Hmm. We'll see. Where's player X and player Y? So gs.ecs.insert um, point new player X, player Y. And then in player.rs, try move player. We'll update the resource when the player moves. So this is when the player's actually moving. So we'll say let mute PPOS player position equal ECS.write resource. And we'll get the point. So this is one that weirds me out a little bit. This tells me that we don't have any other points, right? We don't have any other points in the um, in the ECS. Or it's a resource. We don't have any other resource that are points. All right, sounds good, Omnivore. I will catch you back here later, um, unless I'm done, I guess. <laughs> but uh, I'll definitely catch you back uh, later at some point. Hope you have a good dinner and stuff. Good show. Yeah, I get a little little concerned about the uh, the idea of saying, just get me back this point resource, but like, what if I put another one in? Could I... I know the whole point is, no pun intended, there's only so many resources... Oh, there can only be one. If the resource existed before, it will be overwritten. So I guess you can only have one resource of a given type. Okay. Then I guess that's fine. So yeah, we get the point resource. We modify it with the new position X and Y. And we can use that on our monster AI system. So here's a working version. So yeah, right now they do nothing, so we'll get rid of the console log. Um, let player position you shed monster equal data for view shed. I think I'm gonna have to add another, yeah, I'm gonna have to add one more thing in, but we'll get to that in a moment. View shed and monster in and view shed and monster dot join if view shed dot visible tiles dot contains and star player position now this is something we did earlier console log now we're getting some information about it format monster shouts insults they're doing a little bit more now now we're gonna be mad because we don't have yeah so we, we've changed some things around a little bit and it's not happy about that so we have read expect point And then we have read storage view shed and then read storage monster. So we no longer have position. I assume we're going to need the positions back at some point when the monsters start moving around, however. Um, and then, so it's going to be... Oh, wait a minute. 
Ooh, I, I uglied this up. Hang on. It's fine, though. We can fix it. Yeah, we don't need... We don't need one of these loops. We don't need this one. There we go. I was like, what? Something's weird. All right, so we get the player position, the view shed, and the monster. For each of those entities, all we actually are using is the view shed. If the visible tiles contains the player position, then we have the monster shout insults. So if we do a cargo run, we'll be able to move around and the console will gain monster shouts insults from time to time when the monsters can see me. Now, you should be able to see it at the bottom. Uh, you'll see it move in a moment, like now. Yeah, just below the game, you see monster shouts insults. Now, every time I move, since I'm still visible, they're going to keep doing it. Cool. I like it. Alrighty. So we're just about done making monsters, actually. So we'll do combat next time, because it's already been two and a half hours. Um, so differentiating our monsters. Monsters should have names, so we know who's yelling at us. So we create a new component. Nay, I was wondering if this was going to happen, because I was like, calling it monsters not good. So I was wondering. Um, so we know who's yelling at us, so we create a new component, name. So in components.rs, we'll add that. We register it in main, which you should be comfortable with by now. We'll also add some commands to add names to our monsters and the player. So our monster spawner now looks like this. So we'll add the component, register it, and then check out this monster spawner. Components. Um, what are we deriving? Component and debug. And pub struct name, pub name string. Okay, let's go to main. Register that. And now let's go to the monster spawner. Um, that's it right there. So let's look at what's different. For I room in map.rooms.enter.skip onenumerate So we'll let xy equal room.center. We'll let glyph, but I'm doing mine a little bit differently. We're rolling. Do let name string. And see, this is actually a place where now what they're doing is in these match arms, they're saying glyph equal whatever. We could still do this rusty like. We could say let glyph and name. I can, I can still do it the way I did it. Now we return a tuple and we destructure it. Goblin to string. Orc dot to string. See, we could still do it that way. The alternative, um, what they have here is, I'll just copy paste it. What they have, and this is valid as well, is this right here. We set a variable called glyph and name, and then we actually set them in each, we set glyph equal whatever, name equal whatever uh, manually. So what I could do here, is the same thing except I'm just destructuring a tuple. So I spit out a tuple from this match statement with this um, CP437, this glyph, and the name, and it gets destructured. Kind of like that more. It's a little more rust like, a little more rusty. Either one works though, it's valid. Just 
noting how I'm doing mine a little bit differently there. So I don't need to make that anymore. And then we'll do create entity with a position with a renderable. A view shed with a monster and now with a name. Oh, we're number. I was wondering what that number sign was for. We're actually numbering the monsters. All right. So we just format, we build a string basically. And uh, it'll be like orc number one because we enumerate it. But it's not actually. Um, I'm fighting a sneeze, by the way. So it's like I can barely talk. <laughs> Hold on. Oh man, that'll wake you up. All right, so it's not just monster number one because this enumerate, this I value is coming from which room we're in. So the number is actually just what room we're in rather than like, this is the fifth orc. You know, you're not gonna have two fives. You're not gonna have two ones, even if they're of different types. We're also going to adjust the monster AI system to include the monster's name. So we're going to modify this yet again. Point view shard monster read storage name. Can't find name. Import that. Um, it's just from here. Surprised it wasn't able to figure that out. Um, so now we need to put name on the end. Now that's happy, but we're not using it. So how do we want to use it? Oops. Okay. How do we want to use it? Um, probably in here. So we're going to also join this. Yeah, we are going to join it. So view shed monster name. And so this only the interesting thing is if you have a monster without a name, this doesn't work, right? So you have to be aware of how your system is defined. If it ever makes sense for a monster to not have a name, then your system's not going to work for that monster. Um, but we're going to say blank shouts insults. name dot name all right and then let's just back up a little bit in the tutorial because I've done a lot of steps because we're also going to give the player a name um, so what we've just done we added the name struct which is a component we registered it in main and then every monster was given a name and how we got that name was just kind of hard coding it based on whether it was a, a goblin or orc, right? We already have a G for goblin, so all of those are named goblin. O for orc, so all those are named orc. We also combined the number of whatever room we're in as we're iterating. So if it's the room number one, then it's going to be goblin one. If it's room two, it's going to be orc two and so on. So that's how their names are being created. Um, Monster AI, we added name to the read storage. Um, and then we had to, or we added read storage name, excuse me, to the system data. And then we had to destructure that out of data. And then we added that to our join, which gives us access to the name. So now this loop works for every entity in our ECS that has a view shed, a monster, and a name component. And then for that, we, if it can see the player, that's what that if is still doing. If it can see the player, then it shouts insults. 
And so next, we're gonna give the player a name. We've explicitly included names in the AI's join, so we better be sure that the player has one. Otherwise, the AI will ignore the player altogether. Um, I guess. I have to think about that. <laughs> Otherwise, the AI will ignore the player altogether, and main.rs will include one in the player creation. Why would it ignore the player? Well, let's find out. Let's run it. No, it's shouting insults. It can see me, and it's shouting insults. And notice... Oops, I misspelled orc. Notice if I get to a place where neither can see me, if I'm moving back and forth, no one's shouting. No one's shouting, see? So they are responding to the player. I don't necessarily agree with that statement. And I want to I want to look at the code and explain my reasoning and try to understand why they say they would ignore the player. This loop happens. So so first of all, player position is a resource. It's not a component. We know that resource exists. So we should always be able to get that. The only thing that matters for whether we're visible or not is the player position resource. The play, it doesn't matter what components are on the player. We're not actually using the player component. So this loop, as I already explained, is a loop over every entity that has a view shed, a monster, and name component. I don't see at all how that would matter whether the player has a name component or not, because we obviously just saw that the code works. I like adding one to the player. I'm fine with that, but I, I don't agree with that statement unless I'm misunderstanding their meaning. So with name, we're going to go ahead and add the name to the player. Um, in the player creation, if you cargo run, you'll see things. They now shout insults so you can tell who is shouting. Yeah, I mean, we just saw it, but again, I, I don't agree with that statement of them ignoring the player, and I ran the game to prove it, because I was like, I, I don't think that's going to be the case. Huh. Not sure what is meant by that. I, I wish I knew. But it's good enough for now, though. So that's going to be it. That's actually it. That's a wrap for chapter six. We've added a variety of foul-mouthed monsters to hurl insults at your fragile ego. In this chapter, we've begun to see some of the benefits of using an entity component system. It was really easy to add newly rendered monsters with a bit of variety and start storing names for things. The viewshed code we wrote earlier worked with minimal modification to give visibility to monsters, and our new monster AI was able to take advantage of what we've already built to quite efficiently say bad things to the player. So they are correct. And it was really easy to add newly rendered monsters. I made that comment myself. However, the view shed code only worked as well as it did because it was architected fairly well from the beginning. If you wrote bad view shed code, you might end up finding yourself refactoring the code in order to make it work across different entities like we've done here. I would say it would come with practice, especially how you would use it in an ECS. It would come with practice and you would get better at using it and, uh, and figuring out like how you write your different systems and components and everything. So, so maybe that's a factor here. But I could imagine if you were writing this on your own and you'd never done it, you might end up writing something suboptimal or might end up writing something in a way that could not be reused by the monsters and you would find yourself having to figure out something on the fly, refactor it, etc. Um, I don't think an ECS... I don't know if this is the case. I, I don't think that's what he's saying. 
He just says the view shed code we wrote earlier worked with minimal modification. I don't think that's being attributed to the ECS in that case, but yeah, I don't think an ECS would really help with that. Um, it's just a, a point I want to make that it worked well because it was written well enough from the start. That that's the key that the key takeaway. You could have come up with some weird, ugly, gross system that actually worked, that technically worked, but did not work when you tried to apply it to this, to the monsters. And that, that's all I'm trying to get at. So let's take a sneak peek at next time, because it's been almost three hours, I want to go ahead and call it. And if we actually take a look... Um, if you look at the scroll bar, I'll go to the top here. So we look at the scroll bar, I go to the next chapter, it gets a substantially smaller, almost like half. So next lesson is going to be quite lengthy. I mean, there might be a lot of like big code snippets or something that actually aren't bad. Um, there's, there's a lot going on. So next time may only be damage and no interface, or I may do both. We'll see how the interface, interface isn't too bad. So we'll see what happens. That might end up being so it would be like interface twice would be about the same length as what we did today. Um, this would be about like doing it three times. <laughs> eh, it might be almost another extra hour. I don't mind doing it, but I don't want to like rush, you know, I don't want to rush through it. So taking a sneak peek at dealing damage. Modifying the map a little bit. Oh, because we don't want to be able to walk through enemies. We have diagonal directions. Uh, yep, I like that. Combat stats, indexing, letting the player hit things, player attacking and killing things. Letting monsters hit back. No, I don't want that part. That's not cool. Expanding the turn system. So now we have other options where, where things take like partial turns or whatever. Um, well, partial is not what it... Awaiting input, pre-run, player turn, monster turn, like... You have different... It is called state for a reason. Different states that the game can exist in. So you can, like, basically start taking a turn and then maybe you back out. You don't do a certain action or whatever. We saw that in the last roguelike tutorial where you could open the inventory, but then not make a selection, not use an item so it doesn't actually use a turn. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, okay. Okay. Looks like that's what we're going to be doing next time is combat, which is always fun. Nice walls with bit sets. I didn't even see this one yet. Oh, I think, okay. Interesting. So this is using... Um, Uh, so this is basically a, uh, like a, um, you're using 16 bits here. Or not, um, not 16, not 16 bits. You're using like 8 bits. No, not even 8. Because 8 will get you up to 255. So yeah, I'll get there one day. I'll get there one day. I know what I'm trying to say, but I'm trying to like explain what's in my brain and it's not mapping. I want to like draw it out. So when you do four bits, one, 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 one gets you to 15, right? Zero, 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 zero gets you here. So we're using like four bits, like a single hex character, right? F would be 15 in hex. So I'm interested how we're using how we're using this. There's our U8 that we're using to represent this. We have like a wall on all sides here. So there's like different types of walls and stuff. Ah, okay. This looks cool. I like it. So I know what these numbers are now. Okay. These numbers are matching to different ASCII characters in that font care type that's C, 
CP whatever thing that was on the door. Actually, here it is. I was going to say on the Dwarf Fortress page that we got. Yeah, code page 437. Um, so we use a bit mask to do that as a, a nice shorthand. Okay. Sorry, I got distracted by that because it's interesting to me. That's a really, really tiny, tiny short lesson. I just noticed that too. It's like that one function and then you just like use it here and boom, you're good to go. Cool. I'm excited about that. All right, we'll get to that one day, right? We got to get through. It's going to be like another couple weeks. Get through that. I'm taking it a lot slower than the last tutorial because I've never done this one before. And I want to like really take this in. Again, to me, it feels more in depth than the last tutorial. So I want to make sure I, I, I absorb as much as possible, especially for when we get to the like more advanced algorithms and stuff. Also, I, I'm doing a thing where it lags again as I mouse over these. And I did look at the video. It does lag on. It's not just on my end. It really is lagging. I don't know why, because I, I like to just, like circle things like that. And that just makes it lag. It's weird. OK, so that's going to be it. Um, it was a good session today, Field of View and Monsters out of the way. I would have loved to do Field of View last time, and then we might have done Monsters and Dealing Damage, but uh, that was a terrible headache, so I, I had to, you know, I had to call it. Um, but that puts us in a good spot for next time where we get to start with some of the, the fun, like traditionally fun stuff, you know, combat, getting it going. Um, and again, this is probably going to be a lot like that last tutorial still, but the code is just a little bit more... It's better organized, it's a little bit more in depth. So it's pretty interesting, exciting. So yeah, I hope uh, hope you enjoyed this session here. Um, if you are new and you're watching this, you like the stream, you wanna see more of this coding stuff, you hit that follow button. I do these streams Monday and Wednesday, coding streams. Um, every other day is gameplay. I do like two streams on Saturday. I'll probably start doing two on Sunday as well. I do different games. So if you want to see that, you know, go ahead and check it out too. Uh, if you're watching this in the future on YouTube, congrats on being in the future. You can do all the fun YouTube stuff. Like button, subscribe, notification bell, comments. Give me any feedback. Like, you know, I always try to say when you're following a tutorial, feedback's a little bit less apropos. But, I mean, I do go off on tangents and I try to, you know, look into things that are not necessarily being covered in the tutorial. Or I every once in a while do things my own way a little bit so there are there are cases where maybe uh feedback is welcome but even just in the way i present this how i handle this or whatever i'd, I'd appreciate it because i'd like this to be as good as it can be right i'd like this to be able to help people or just be entertaining or whatever right so i do appreciate that so uh until next time whether it is tomorrow on a gameplay stream or um Ne next week on Monday on the next coding stream. Until next time, have a good day, have a good night, whatever it is, wherever you're at, take it easy. I hear it's amazing when the famous purple stuffed worm in Flapjaw space with the tuning fork does a raw blink on Harry Carey Rock. I need scissors. 61.